What's up, world? Uh, today we have uh, Mr. William Bridge, Dr. William Bridge, should I say. How you doing, Dr. William? Hey, Juan. How's it going, man? Pretty good, man. Thank you for joining, joining us on this podcast today again. As I know that you had to, um, you know, it's your day off and you decided to go inside your your um, your hospital office, I think it is, or hospital study room to do the podcast. And I appreciate that, man. And I'm sure everybody listening appreciates that as well because we're all interested in what you have to say as it's Mental Health Awareness Month over here, um, around the world, that is, not just over here. And um, someone with your experience, it's it's nice to talk to about mental health, you know? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, thanks for having me, man. I think... Um you know, uh, one of the more fascinating things about mental health is, uh, you know, kind of the multitude of uh, facets to it. So I'm interested to kind of see where uh, uh, the conversation takes us today and, um, you know, ready to get started. So w when we talk about mental health, William, and, and we're going to get right into it as we usually do, is mental health is a lot more than just scrolling through someone's social media and seeing all the pictures they have and whether they're smiling or not, what they're wearing and say, oh, that person's happy. That person's having a great life. That person must have a great mental health. Um, that doesn't really work like that, as we know. And uh, uh, mental health is much more complex than that. It's basically your way of being. And it doesn't mean ab absence of sym symptomatology. It just means you're able to deal with life's challenges as they come about in a healthy way and you're able to take time off and 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 you're able to function in a healthy manner that's typical to the to a regular human being and so the reason i bring up social media so early on in the podcast william is because i was reading on a study and one study william out of the university of pittsburgh for example found a correlation between time spent scrolling through social media apps and negative body image feedback. So just to get a, just to get it uh, for a little, explain a little bit better to the, to the people listening to the podcast is the more time Pittsburgh, the university of Pittsburgh found was the more time someone spends scrolling through social media, whether it be on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Tumblr, whatever it is, the higher chance they have of having a negative body image. And one of the things they found is because when we look at other people, whether we realize it or not, we're always assessing. That's part of life, constantly assessing. And social media definitely affects our mental health. And I wanted to kick it real quick to this, William, right off the back, because social media um, is big time in our lives, especially for someone like us who are social media influencers. Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, you said a lot of uh, very meaningful things. Uh, the biggest being, you know, we're, uh, you know, looking through somebody else's feed and you can't help but, you know, compare yourself. Uh, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, second, uh, seconding what you were saying, you know, the, the body image is definitely a part of it. Uh, but, you know, I would add, you know, you see that, uh, you know, different uh, people are posting uh, their graduation or, you know, their family reunion. And, you um, you know, some of the people that uh, don't have the resources to, you know, uh, graduate or, you know, go on to med school or graduate school. And, you know, I think it has an impact on uh, self-esteem as well. Um, you know, so the self image is there, of course, but uh, kind of the, um, you know, the, the mindful part of uh, body image is self esteem. So, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I know of any studies on it, but uh, definitely something to consider as well. Well, the University of Pittsburgh in this specific uh, research they did, it showed also a correlation, not only in negative body image, but in symptoms of anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. And it's, they also mentioned that it's difficult to get a good read on the issue uh, on social media because it's constantly changing and evolving. And that's one thing we've talked about before, William, the mental health struggles that individuals are facing in today's society, I believe is a big part in due to how fast society changes within itself. So let's say um, the 1700s, 
the, the difference in what happened in 1720 and 1750, the, the change in, in attire that people wear, the fashion changes, um, how much information is out there that's constantly uh, changing technology, advancing was limited compared to today's society that from 2015 to 2019, things can change pretty quickly. And I'll just give you some examples from the fall of Facebook to the rise of Instagram. And I don't want to say the fall, but, you know, um, the less interaction on Facebook to the rise on Instagram and interaction from the cards we drive to the computer, something we buy a computer in two, uh, three years ago. And in today, it's, it's almost irrelevant compared to what's coming out in today. And things change pretty fast. I'm wondering, and I, and I want to do more um, readings on how that, that change that we experience in society and how fast society changes and in the rate that it changes today actually affect our mental health. But it's good that we're talking about mental health, William, because we're going to, in this podcast today, and we've already started, we're going to start um, talking about the myths and facts involved in mental health. And if you're okay with this, if you're okay with this, I like to read a couple things, a couple myths, and a couple facts in relation to mental health. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, this will uh, this will be good. I'll try to, um, you know, if uh, it uh, is a myth versus a fact, I'll, I'll you know, try to uh, shed some light as to uh, why it's a myth and uh, possibly my thoughts on, you know, what would make it accurate. So. Uh, this will be good. This is always fun to do. Okay. Uh, I appreciate that, William. So here I go. And these are some that I wrote down. If, if I go to work and I go to school and I have friends, then I should be mentally healthy 100%. There are no issues involved in, in my behaviors and in my way of being. That mean, if, if Basically, if I'm, if I'm functioning and I'm able to do my daily activities, then I'm mentally healthy. Myth for fact. So, I, I mean, I think this is kind of a, a misconception. So that would be, you know, more of a, a myth just because, you know, uh, not any one person, in my opinion, um, you know, can say, I go to work, I have friends, uh, that's everything. You know what I mean? Because there's, you know, in the uh, sentence or uh, uh, statement that you just made, it didn't talk at all about what the person feels about themselves. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of a, a, a big key factor uh, to this. Just to piggyback off what you were saying, William, uh, you're completely right when you mention how just because someone has friends and, it, and works and engages in their school life and they're able to function, that doesn't mean they're completely mentally healthy. And the reason that is, is because mental health it involves many variables. And it's not just about accomplishing tasks and being able to engage in activities or in goals that you want to do. It involves much more than that. It involves peace of mind. It involves you... Um, being able to think clearly, being able to be stable, oriented, calm when it matters. And here are some facts, and, I, and we're going to keep going off the facts or myth, but one in five American adults experience a mental health issue. And I'll go on to say that one in 10 young people experience a period of major depression. And just so everybody knows, these facts are on mentalhealth.gov. One in 25 Americans lived with a series has lived with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder and that's important to note because we don't realize how many people are struggling with mental health and a matter of fact when we hear the word health in general we think of physical health we think of did you go see your doctor for your 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 checkup but we don't, we don't care to think when the doctor says, yeah, you're physically okay, you have no symptoms of diabetes, your, 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 your heart's functioning cur um, properly. They never ask about how you're doing in your daily life if you have a good social support system. And as we know from past research, the, the bigger your support system, oftentimes, the happier you are because the more so healthy social functioning relationships you have. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just a comment about the uh, physical versus uh, mental health. So there's there's lots of uh, research out there about, you know, you use the example of a diabetic patient. 
And um, they're basically retrospective uh, views of large groups of patients. So uh, if they took a group of, uh, let's say, type 2 diabetics um, and followed them throughout the you know, course of their life until they were deceased, and they took a group of type 2 diabetics who also had depression, and they followed them throughout the uh, uh, course of their life until they deceased. What we found is, and this is true for diabetes, blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular health, uh, you name it, that if there is comorbid uh, mental illness, those patients are uh, dying a lot sooner. Um, and this is for controlling all variables, you know, everything from, you know, age, uh, age of onset of disease, um, you know, other comorbidities, race, uh, gender. So if you keep everything stable, the patients uh, that had either a lack of mental illness or well-treated mental illness uh, live a lot longer. So, um, you know, just to kind of uh, add to what you were saying, we just, you really can't separate the two um, because everybody has uh, mentation. So there should be an assessment of uh, everybody's mental health. You know, I always say um, in a perfect world, everybody would be able to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a mental health provider on a, a you know monthly basis. And and that's and that's interesting that you mentioned that how. You really can't separate the two, but yet us in society and society at large try separating the two. What do you think needs to be done, William, for that stigma involved around mental health, around going to see a professional um, can be done? What can we do to, to raise awareness? Aside from what we, you and I are already doing, whether it be um, posting on Instagram or just doing this podcast in general, aside from other mental health videos and, and actually engaging in our practice. Um, what else can, can we do as, a, as individuals and society at large to tackle this dilemma that you just mentioned on how we're trying to separate the two when really they should be, uh, they should really be together when we talk about health. Yeah, I know, um, you know, uh, uh, definitely that's pretty, uh, you know, hot in the literature as well as a lot of uh, pilot programs going on right now is uh, uh, something by the name of uh, integrative care. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, meanings as to as far as what, you know, this could be defined as. But I think the, the general meaning is that, you know, when you go to uh, your family doctor, so usually a, a you know, family practice or internal medicine, your primary care doctor, um, that's the number one that they're screening for more common uh, mental health symptoms, such as, you know, uh, quick depression uh, screening. It could be done anywhere from two to uh, uh, eight questions, eight or nine questions, and uh, anxiety, sleep. You know, these are just, you know, quick things that unless you know to ask about it, the patients uh, might very well not offer, you know, because a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, they could talk to their, the doctor that's treating their blood pressure about, you know, if they've been having uh, negative thoughts or um, they think that their minds, uh, you know, not as sharp as it used to be, or memory is changing or anxiety is peaking. So whatever it may be. And I think a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of these primary care clinics are trying to implement, whether it's through telepsychiatry, you know, kind of how you and I are talking now, um, to have a psychiatrist um, that can do a visit, you know, even though they're across the other side of Florida or North Carolina. So I think, you know, as a, a medical society, I think we're trying to uh, let the uh, providers with the more basic reach to uh, patients start the process. And if they need help, then we kind of uh, uh, involve, uh, you know, those providers with a little bit uh, more experience, such as uh, yourself in the substance abuse uh, realm or uh, sleep uh, pulmonologist or whatever the case may be. Integrative care, basically um, collaboration among not only mental health professionals, but just the health industry at large is when I think about when I hear those words. And, 
And that's important too. And William, I actually have a whole script and everything for this podcast, but I'm going to actually just talk with you for a second because um, mm -hmm. there's uh, me as, as a clinician here in Miami, Florida, and I'm working towards licensure, as you know, the, I noticed that, yeah, the, people talk a lot about mental health. It's almost a trend now. Yeah, uh, we got to worry about their mental health. And they're obviously talking about the clients and, and we got to find resources for them. But I think a big issue you just mentioned about integrative care, which is so important. But there's also a big issue. Now it's become almost like a, a, a monetized monopoly almost sometimes um, because, and, and this is just from what I've witnessed. I'm not saying that this is what it is everywhere or anything of that sort. I'm just saying from what I've witnessed. And when I go to um, meetings, meetings, for example, uh, SFVHN or DCF or, or whatever the case is, and you have all these agencies together that provide services and they're in the meetings and they do presentations and what's new, what, what do we have to adapt um, as far as the services and stuff. They're, they're almost politicizing the services because it's about who knows who and that person's going to get the first referral for the client. And there's something wrong with that picture because the client, it, they, it's not just, it, it's not about just, oh, let me refer them to this person because I know it should be about, okay, I'm referring this client to this agency or this specific clinician because this clinician or this agency has the tools and resources to help this client for what they need. For mm -hmm. example, substance abuse, mental health, Maybe the clinician specializes and has a good report with the court system. So that client has court involvement, but no, they politicize it. Who knows who? So I know this agency very well, and this is going to be the first agency I send the clients to. And would you say that there's something wrong in politicizing mental health services? Well, you know, I think that, um, you know, uh, the most important part is that, you know, we kind of, uh, cast a, a, a really broad net uh, starting out uh, to make sure that, you know, now that, uh, you know, I, I feel like even maybe when my, uh, my parents were in high school, there was, you know, it was depression and that was about it, you know, I mean, um, and even then uh, depression was kind of looked at as, well, you know, it's just something that'll pass with time. Um, so I think that as we've kind of, uh, you know, strengthened our awareness, um, it's important to, you know, uh, provide services that everyone um, that needs the help can be reached um, and have the resources. Um, but when it comes to, you know, uh, for example, let's say that there's a, a waiting list at an inpatient uh, detox or rehab, of uh, 50, 50 some odd patients. Um, and then um, somebody that knows somebody on the, uh, you know, admissions uh, team of that given facility, um, you know, gets the cut in line. You know, I think that, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, some of these things will happen uh, no matter what uh, area of medicine or, uh, you know, work or, uh, you know, finance, you know, you name it, I would say that it's going to go on. But I think that, um, you know, the, the biggest thing is that, uh, you know, uh, that the people that need the help know how to ask for it. And at least they can, uh, you know, start the triage process of, uh, you know, getting uh, plugged in with a provider that can uh, offer some assistance. Yeah. And, and, and now this takes, and when you say, get plugged in with a provider that can provide some assistance and therapeutic services and evidence-based treatment um, services as well. Yeah. What about those that, because the United States is still evolving and we're both from the United States, just different regions of the United States, which makes it kind of cool. You know, we're not both from the same region. So we get to see mental health in two different locations. What about those? Um, I read some research that, those within the prison system or the jail system or the juvenile system, those, they, uh, the individuals within the system, they're struggling oftentimes with mental illnesses and mental disorders and, and they're struggling with their mental health. 
And, and oftentimes when someone's struggling with their mental health and they don't know how to ask for help, then their, their behavior intensifies. Um, all of a sudden you have someone that's struggling with substance use or substance abuse or addiction, and now they're forced to steal. They were never able to receive the services of therapeutic substance use services. So either they get criminalized for using or their use leads them to the de delinquent type behaviors. Um, and once they're in, once it's too late, they're already within the jail system. And I agree with you 100%. If someone gets the, get, uh, gets plugged with a, with a th uh, therapeutic services or a treatment provider, maybe we can hold back on the jail population here in the United States, which as we know, it's the biggest in the world. And those that are already within the jail system, they tend to have some sort of mental health diagnosis, some mental illness. I think I read once, um, and don't quote me exactly off this, but it was close to 40%. And so how are we gonna tackle this dilemma as a society? And obviously you and I are just two individuals and we're just talking about it. So we can raise awareness for those that are listening, that are kind enough to listen, for the listeners out there. But that's a big dilemma, isn't it, William? Where about 40% of the prison population or jail population are, are uh, meet the criteria for a mental illness. And that's kind of tough. And just for those that, are, that don't know, a mental illness is um, and generalized anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar, borderline personality. Um, have you ever heard of this statistic, William? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. I didn't know the, um, you know, I didn't know the uh, percentage. I think uh, more of uh, uh, readings that I've uh, come across is, uh, you know, some of the limitations uh, which we're alluding to, to um, them having some, uh, you know, uh, professional uh, mental health um, help in, in one form or the other. And I think that, you know, uh, anytime you deal um, in the realm of a, a patient population where there is a significant, um, you know, counterpoint in their life. So uh, some of the challenges I think with uh, uh, the prison population is, you know, you have to identify, was this a, was this a diagnosis that you thought existed before the onset of, uh, you know, their sentence, or was this uh, something that, uh, you know, occurred as a consequence of the, the jail sentence? And, you know, is it involved with some kind of psychological or physical trauma while in jail? So, um, you know, that's the biggest thing, you know, there a lot of these, um, you know, uh, inmates uh, will, you know, have, come to the point of being in jail because of a lack of resources, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, you have to wonder, you know, was if they didn't have resources, uh, you know, for mental health, uh, you know, what other resources were they, were they missing, you know, transportation, um, you know, access to, uh, you know, clean water, uh, electricity and so forth. So, you know, uh, that's a huge challenge with them. And then the other part is making sure that um, we, we have enough providers that uh, are willing to work uh, in the system. And, um, you know, I think the uh, forensic psychiatry, when it comes to um, determining, is it a mental illness that was driving um, the given crime, um, that's, we can definitely do a whole, podcasts on forensic uh, psychology, psychiatry alone, but, uh, you know, it's a very complex um, patient population, but complex in the sense that, you know, they need uh, mental, mental health uh, assistance more than, more than, uh, if not more than equal to everyone. There's so many variables involved, especially you brought up an interesting point, William, that what about if the mental illness occurred, was, was happening or, or they were experiencing the symptoms sometime before they went to jail or it happened sometime after once they were already in jail, whether it be through physical trauma or actually something that happened in jail. And that's, an, that's important to note in the statistic that I had, that I had read. But um, what the, it, the main reason I brought that up, obviously, it's because it's important. But the second reason is because 
society in general, the United States compared to some other countries, um, they're doing well when it comes to mental health. It's, it's becoming a topic, even though it's becoming a mainstream topic, which we've gotten into in the past, but mm -hmm. it's also becoming, um, it's also an important topic for this population so people can get the resources before it gets to the level where they do something that they have to now be in jail for. And, and, and that's, an important, that's an important line um, for them to receive help because uh, the prison population here is huge. And once someone's in a jail cell, we're animals. And um, we do in their experience, I've never been in jail, but I work with those that were in there. They do experience trauma in there, especially when you're locked up in a cage or in a 10 foot by 10 foot room. Um, although I don't want to, I, I, every situation is a case by case basis when we talk about the prison population in there. I don't just want to group them all up together because that's not fair. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there's no something in set in stone. It's, it's always uh, involves abstract morality. But anyways, let's, let's move on with the podcast, William. And sure. um, there's factor myth. All children, no children can experience any mental health issues or mental health struggles, fact or, or, or fiction. Or myth, so, I mean, oh, excuse me, fact or myth, so, excuse me, sorry about that. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I mean, I um, uh, definitely, I mean, there's, uh, there's uh, you know, and maybe not everybody knows this, but there are, um, you know, certain uh, mental health uh, disorders that only occur in children. Mm -hmm. I can kind of talk about a, a few examples of those. So um, there, I, I think that, uh, you know, so that's the fact that children um, can, you know, be depressed, uh, have panic disorder, have conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder. There's um, uh, no immunity in uh, the pediatric population from mental illness. Or mood dysregulation disorder, which is uh, it's like uh, adolescent diagnosis for um, bipolar disorder. Because, but yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There are, there, it's, it's a myth because there are some diagnoses that are just for the, for children. And I think there's a, there's actually a special DSM that, that for children to go by, I think it's the DSM 5.0. Is that, or, or is, is that not the name for it? So um, for the, uh, for the adult and, you know, just like we are referencing the uh, forensic psychiatry, there is a subspecialty of psychiatry that is called uh, uh, child and adolescent. Um, but uh, as a medical specialty, um, we both reference the DSM, but within the DSM, there, uh, there are those disorders and how to classify and specify them um, for the uh, pediatric uh, population, those uh, less than 18 years old. So um, there's, there's disorders, just to you know, kind of reiterate, there's disorders that are seen in adults and children, such as major depressive disorder. Um, and there's disorders in children, such as, you know, conduct disorder that will only be diagnosed in the pediatric population. And when it, uh, you know, the child then uh, breaches the 18 years old mark, the disorder, um, you know, in some settings will be changed to a different name. How how and and this is from once again from the mentalhealth.gov website um which allows us to debunk and what what's a really a fact and what's not and it says here half of all mental health disorders show first signs before a person turns 14 years old and three quarters of mental health disorders begin after age 24. and uh one this is a good opportunity and I, man, we, we can have a podcast going on, William, for, for, for 10 hours straight concerning mental health. But, but, you know, we're trying to do this all within an hour. But um, part of mental health is trauma. And trauma, and I've talked about this before, whether it be on Instagram and other videos and another podcast, even with you, William, that trauma around the world, it's seen differently. It's, it still hasn't evolved in some countries. And one, one example is Southeast Asia, where trauma is still viewed in a physical light it's not necessarily viewed as an event that takes place that's perceived a certain way and now since it's perceived that way the person's life all of a sudden um takes a course because they're being affected by that 
by the way they perceive that event, almost like a butterfly effect. Um, and so when we talk about trauma, it's an event that happens and it's definitely related to mental health. And some people say I've had, it's mostly adults when I talk to about this, that they don't believe necessarily that, um, a person and, and look at the vocabulary they use. They tend to be excused or they're not, they need to be strong, um, which are all true. They need to be strong. They, um, just because one event happens in a person's life, it shouldn't excuse, um, them to give up uh, for them to give up on life or anything like that. But it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. I always tell them because a perfect example is like a divorce and that's on the ACE trauma scale. And when a child uh, is of, let's say a victim of parents that are going through a divorce, especially an ugly divorce, William, then all of a sudden their life, their support system takes a crack. And depending on how ugly the divorce is, the bigger the crack and, and you have things that, that can affect the child. Maybe the parents start talking bad um, to each other about one, one or the other, or maybe um, now it's more extra financial hardship and the kid doesn't know where he's going to be on the weekend. So there's no consistency on their part. And that definitely has an effect on the child. Now that we're talking about um, if children experience mental health issues. And so trauma is also big in mental health and how we assess trauma is important as well whether it be for children or whether it be for adults. And that definitely goes in with half of all mental health disorders show, show signs before a person turns 14 years old. For all my adolescent clients, William, I always give, I always, uh, one of the assessments I use is the ACE trauma scale because that's a good way to, for me to assess um, their trauma history. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, uh, one, do you want to uh, define a butterfly effect for, for those? Well, the, butter, the butterfly, I posted about that and I had a bunch of messages the other day about that. And the, the, yes. the butterfly effect for me, it's, it's when you make a decision or you do something and all of a sudden it changes the events that transpire after in not only society, but in your life. And, um, one way we can look at it, the butterfly effect is, for example, the moment um, someone who's not living a healthy lifestyle makes one decision all of a sudden to start going to the gym every morning and they start going to the gym every morning, they start maybe eating healthier. This is obviously multiple decisions they're making, but all of a sudden that changes the course of events for them. And, they, it may, and it's going to happen in an unconscious level and we can never really measure how much of an effect that change had but it had to change. All of a sudden, they may feel more self-confident about themselves. Their body appearing changes. Maybe they become more attractive to the opposite sex. And with that comes a whole series of variables that present themselves and doors that close as well. Um, it's more of a philosophical thing, but I'm glad you brought that up when I say the butterfly effect. Have you heard yeah, of this I, term before, William? Yeah, and uh, I guess... <laughs> it, um, my understanding is that, uh, you know, as well that, so the name kind of comes from the, the premise that, you know, uh, a butterfly flapping its wings in uh, one part of the world can uh, cause a, a streamline or cascade of events that can cause a tsunami halfway around the world, you know, so that's the, the it can have like the smallest decisions uh, can lead to a completely different series a chain of events that can lead to completely different stratosphere um, and, you know, uh, impact. Uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, negative as well. You know, you gave a good positive example, um, but it, it just kind of goes to the point that, uh, you know, every day we're making, you know, you know hundreds, if not a thousand decisions and they all have, um, you know, uh, severe, either positive or even uh, sometimes negative uh, downstream consequences. But uh, I think, you know, decisions really uh, come down to a lot of uh, uh, patients' uh, mental well-being. Uh, you know, you can pretty much, you can uh, think yourself into a, a negative mood over and over and over again. But if you change your thoughts uh you know that alone can kind of change 
a lot of your outlook. So, um, you know, it's a good concept. Yeah, and, and I appreciate here. And I appreciate and I appreciate you, William, a lot for for thinking that it's a good concept, you know. And and thank you for saying I use it in a positive light. But the reason uh, the butterfly effect is so important is because when people say, like we were talking earlier about trauma, oh, um, and it's mostly adults that I get this from. Oh, yeah, that the the, the divorce shouldn't have a um, shouldn't be an excuse for him to act out and and be and meet the criteria for oppositional defiance disorder, right? I've had adults tell me that that shouldn't be a reason for them to be defined now, that it shouldn't be a reason for them to do whatever they want to do and engage in substance use. I always let them know that it's not necessarily the divorce itself, mm -hmm. but the way the child perceived the, the divorce at the time that it happened and it was never addressed. And all of a sudden with that, with that person or that individual or at the time the child was, was, was experiencing was, was not good for their mental health. They were experiencing, they were struggling with their mental health. It was never addressed. And now it's led down a road that it is where it is. And that's almost like the butterfly effect. And, and, full, and parents, when they say that to me, something like that shouldn't be an excuse. It's almost like they don't want to accept that they have some fault in the way their child is. And that's really what it is. And that's actually part of therapy sometimes, um, helping the parent understand why things are the way they are and how are we going to go about this in a healthy manner and sometimes they don't want to fully hear the full story because i work a lot on my clients um i have to talk with the parents because the parents are with them you know i only see them maybe one and if it's intensive outpatient two to three times a week but the parents are always with them that what they have to say is important mm -hmm. now uh, william do you mind if we go to the next myth or fact concerning mental health yeah, that sounds, uh, that sounds good. So this kind of goes to um, what we were talking about earlier. So is this a fact or a myth, William? Personality weakness or character flaws cause mental health problems. People with mental health problems can snap out of it if they try hard enough. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, we kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, grazed over that. But, you know, it's not ever going to be, uh, you know, uh, personality characteristic that commits somebody to uh, a diagnosis, you know, there's, there's never going to be anything that uh, can be shaken off. And we've talked about it before. Um, you know, if you're talking about the long term, if you look at the imaging uh, scans of somebody who's got ADHD um, versus somebody who does not, uh, and you look at uh, uh, brain imaging, uh, we're seeing biological, uh, you know, organic differences in different areas of the brain. So, you know, I, I think that if you would apply that to something like, um, for example, let's say Alzheimer's, uh, where you have brain loss, uh, generalized uh, atrophy, you would never expect somebody with Alzheimer's that has brain, physical brain changes just to be able to brush it off. So I think you know, part of the challenge is, uh, you know, uh, making sure that uh, people understand, um, you know, that uh, this is as real as any uh, physical uh, illness. Uh, and to be honest, uh, you know, I, I always use the analogy of, uh, you know, uh, pneumonia. So pneumonia, basically an infection in the lungs that can cause a systemic uh, response. So you can have fever, you can have productive cough. You can have change in your uh, mental status if you know you're you're sick enough or septic. And we have we have these different uh, medicines that treat different parts of that pneumonia. You have something to address fever, something to address the infection, antibiotics, um, and the same thing with mental health is you know if. If you're depressed and you have uh, some anxious distress with that, there's ways to approach those separately. Um, and if your uh, depression is causing you to not be able to initiate sleep, that's uh, different. Uh, so it's never going to be uh, a personality uh, that alone like commits somebody to a, a mental illness. But I think that certain uh, you know uh, characteristics of a person may either have them uh, less susceptible to developing something or more susceptible, but it's not an end-all be-all. 
And and um, with the, um, I agree with you 100%, William, because there's biological factors, life experiences, family history, and 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 just history in general of the individual and the way they perceive events. But mm -hmm. there's there's one thing when when this word personality and um, you know, I don't mean to turn all you know, we're both Westerners. Let's be honest here, we're both Westerners, and I don't mean to become all spiritual on, on you or anything, but. When we talk about personality, that's a very that's a term that that's very um, disputed across the world because people question that uh, personality is just a it's just a person identifying with different aspects of their themselves and their life. But I don't want to get into that too much. The way of, personality is another way of saying for me way of being, and I do that for the audience because William, we do have some people from Asia that listen. So when I use when we use the word personality, we're almost talking about the way of being of a person. And so, thank you for clap. We're we're gonna keep going with the myth and facts, and that was some great information that you gave us there, William. But uh, this is a factor myth: therapy and self help are a waste of time. And do you mind if I answer this one? No, it's all you. Yeah, and this is a for sure myth. Um, you know, because sometimes, and I had to answer this from William, because oftentimes I get parents that they think therapy is going to be causational, meaning it's a for sure change. And it's going to be a change in the way that the parents want the kid to be. And if that's the case, then maybe therapy is a waste of time. But, um, the fact is, is that treatment for mental health issues, uh, they vary depending on individuals and could include medication therapy or both. And we've talked about that, William, how sometimes it's not just therapy. It's also the medication involved. If I have a client that's struggling with a mood dysregulation disorder, and just for those, once again, for those that aren't aware, that's, um, that's the diagnosis for, for, for those under 18. And later on, sometimes that changes to bipolar disorder. But if I have someone struggling with a mood dysregulation disorder, it's going to be hard for them to engage in the therapeutic services and for them to engage in their daily in healthy life in a healthy lifestyle without the medication needed. Although the therapy is going to be beneficial, whether because they need someone to talk to or because we're working on their behavior, whether it's through behavior modification, behavioral orientation, cognitive orientation, or a trauma focused approach. That's important. And so one important factor in therapy, guys, is your social support system. It goes to show that if, and it's shown a lot with substance abuse, is that the biggest determining variable, if someone's going to be able to remain abstinent and for relapse prevention, is the social support system. And, and social support system involves those around you, as well as the environment at play. If I'm living in a place that has a high crime rate and they're engaging in a lot of substance use behaviors all around me and I'm trying to remain clean and I have a history of using, more, more often than not, I am going to relapse. And that's important to note. So therapy and self-help are not a waste of time. And it's important, like we were talking about earlier, for just like it's normal for you to see a doctor for checkups and whatnot once a year, it's also important for you to go see maybe a mental health professional and get an assessment once, um, once a year, just so you can see where you stand as far as mental health, because only 5% of what we think is conscious. And maybe that's not in our conscious awareness. Sometimes we put ourselves to the side for others. And I know I can definitely relate to that, William. But uh, William, when, when we talk about, and we're going to keep talking about mental health on this podcast, and I've had a good time talking with you about it so far. Um, I wanted to touch, I wanted to talk to you about something because I had read up about this in grad school. And just like, as you know, I recently graduated. Um, and I'm going to go back to trauma once again, because trauma, it's a hot topic within the mental health field. You know how people throw around mental health? Well, those within the mental health field are now also throwing around the word trauma, you know, and, and that's important. And we, we just touched on trauma a little bit. But what about the trauma gene? And I don't know if you ever heard about this, William. I know that at the hospital where you work, you guys, I think you told me you guys have a monthly meeting where you guys, one of you guys presents the latest research, or I'm not sure if it was once a week or once a month. What is it, William? Once, 
Go ahead. Once, a, uh, once a month uh, for, uh, you know, kind of the latest uh, literature um, in uh, mental health psychiatry that would uh, change your uh, practice. So that's kind of the, you know, we clinically relevant uh, published research that uh, will make you think about uh, certain decisions that we make on an everyday basis. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot more coming out in terms of, uh, you know, kind of the gene mapping. And uh, <laughs> you knew where I was yeah. going with it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what what's um? I used to talk about this in class and it wasn't too long ago because I recently graduated. But there was a research study done on those that were involved, um, those that were victims of World War Two obviously those that were within the concentration camps and how they're after their, con their time in the concentration camp, they, their kids experienced some of the same symptoms they experienced when they left the concentration camp. Their cortisol levels were higher than, than normal, almost like their brain wiring um, was handed down from their parents or their chemical imbalance was handed down genetically um, and I can't talk too much about this because my confidence is limited on this, mm -hmm. but I was hoping that maybe you can shed some light if you have any, um, if you've read any of the articles concerning this. So, I mean, I think that uh, the, the basics of it uh, are that, you know, when you, um, you know, I think that's something that maybe is worth uh, mentioning is that um, when we talk about uh, trauma, uh, that's kind of a, an umbrella term in that a lot of things can fall within it. But if we're talking about diagnostic criteria, um, it's not the, it's not the only uh, diagnosis, but I, I think that PTSD, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, commonly goes hand in hand with a trauma uh, adjustment disorder can follow a, a, some sort of trauma. Um, but I think that you know what we're what we're seeing is that there's more than a statistical chance that if you take everybody that has um, you know uh, parents or first degree relatives that were in let's use for example uh, active combat um, and you look at the offspring of uh, you know that uh, soldier or uh, military. Uh, member that was in active uh, deployment uh, combat, there is uh, beyond this uh, statistical chance that they'll have a higher likelihood of um, being hypersensitive to um, even uh, traumas that would be outside of uh, military exposure. So if you had a, uh, you know, simply a little bit simpler put, if you had a father that was uh, deployed in Afghanistan and came back, uh, met criteria for PTSD, his children uh, have a higher likelihood of uh, being more susceptible to trauma and subsequently uh, being di diagnosed with PTSD. Now, it's not to say that everybody that has, um, you know, a relative in the uh, uh, active combat will develop a PTSD. There's soldiers that, uh, you know, come back and do not meet criteria for PTSD. It's just, uh, you know, everything in medicine is, uh, should be looked at from a multifactorial approach. So, you know, there's going to be genetics, there's going to be environments, there's going to be uh, comid, uh, comorbid uh, illnesses that may be a uh, you know, contributing uh, nutrition, uh, sunlight exposure, um, socioeconomical status. It's just, it's never one thing, but um, trauma can be uh, identified as having uh, genetic ties. Um, uh, so I agree with what you're saying. There's, a, yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned that, William, that there's so many variables at play. And it doesn't matter whether we have the best assessment ever made by mankind, there, there's so many variables at play that we talk sometimes in terms of absolute, oh, this is like this because of this. And really it's, this is like this because of this and all the other variables in, um, interacting with one another, like you just mentioned. So it's true. And um, it's like uh, the age old 
it used to be an age-old question, nature versus nurture, but now we know that it's both of them in interchangeably um, coexisting together that make things come about within the individual and society at large. So when we're talking about the, when you just mentioned the genetic trauma, I guess you said uh, concerning PTSD, someone may, may be more vulnerable to all of a sudden experiencing now um, the symptoms of PTSD, like you gave the example, but it's the genetics interacting with the environment that'll make that come about. And I appreciate you sharing that, William, for the audience. And uh, I wanted to maybe, you know, William, we're going to have so many other podcasts and just for so everybody knows out there, we're doing this podcast for Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and it's just called Mental Health, Understanding Mental Health, with all, obviously we have here a doctor, Dr. William Bridge. And, and, and I wanted to close this podcast out, William, even though we do a podcast every week concerning different topics of mental health, is how mental health affects the family. So, yes, when we say um, here in the United States, approximately about one in five individuals uh, struggle with a mental Ill the, the criteria for mental illness, okay, you may say, oh, that's only 20% of the population. So um, how does that affect me? Well, it affects you because mental health doesn't just affect the individual, it affects society. And within society comes the individual's family as well. And I'm just going to give you a, an example. If someone starts struggling with dementia, right, uh, an older person, an elderly, starts struggling with dementia, this is very difficult, especially for the partner, their person's partner, because it hurts. You've been there with that person for so long, but it also affects the person's family because now the person's family has to make adjustments, has to worry about this person. They're all collaborating on how they're going to give this person a ride to the hospital or what medication this person needs. And the person obviously can't function for themselves. And this is just one example. And it's good if you are, have a family member that's struggling with a mental illness, whether it be because of substance use, trauma, or dementia, whatever the case may be, that you also screen yourself for, um, for, for your me own mental health because sometimes we are so busy in life, William, that now having a loved one struggling with a mental illness, that brings a whole other set of, of uh, expectations involved in your life. And that, that can be tough, right? And I'm sure you've seen that a lot at the hospital where you give a diagnosis or the person struggling with their diagnosis and and, and their behaviors and the sim symptomatology. And all of a sudden the family is also affected as well. Have you seen that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a two way street uh, from the standpoint that, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, have, let's say, for example, a, a 18 year old that has, uh, goes off to college and then a year later, um, has uh, his or her first psychotic break. And there's no history of any mental illness in the family. Um, you know, obviously, this is a very, very um, traumatizing news to find out, you know, the, you know, uh, first of three children, uh, the oldest went off to college, was very bright, gets diagnosed with a, a schizophrenia, um, and you know the the family's uh, impacted, and everybody in their own ways is impacted uh, by that. So, you know, will um, the mom need to be responsible for making sure the prescriptions don't run out, or will the patient be high uh, functioning enough to take care of that on their own? Uh, will the father be responsible for? Um, you know, making sure the co-pays for the clinic appointments or the medical bills or the hospital admission is covered. Uh, will the siblings be involved with uh, kind of raising their concerns at the clinic appointments? You know, maybe there's uh, a brother that is two years younger that is concerned. You know, what is the likelihood that I'll end up with schizophrenia? So there's, it affects everybody in the, the family and you know, really everybody, um, even beyond the family, uh, you know, uh, friends, uh, you know, more distant relatives, et cetera, everyone kind of has their own, um, you know, uh, 
processing uh, of news like that. But the flip side being that if you have a, um, a family history of a mental illness, let's you know take for example something like um, you know bipolar disorder. Um, if if you know the parents, uh, let's say the mom's sister, the patient's aunt um, has a history of bipolar one disorder. Um, when I think a lot of uh, a benefit uh, from a family standpoint is that they've probably seen the other uh, relative uh, when she's on her medicines and she is completely able to function and you never know she had uh, a history of uh, mania or um, depression. And it's, it helps seeing that, um, that the family knows, well, you know, now that our son or daughter uh, carries this diagnosis, um, you know, they can lead a normal life and it's a real thing. I've seen, I've seen the aunt not uh, uh, taking her medicine and having to be hospitalized. So it takes uh, uh, some of the education uh, uh, out of it when the family is familiar with the disorder, but um, it's never, never easy. And um, it needs to be a, uh, you know, family uh, involved approach if, if the patient is up for that. And when you say family involved approach, you mean social support, which is very, very important. Um, thanks so much for that, William. And uh, I think William with this will conclude today's podcast i think today's podcast william if there's something i'm going to get out of it is that mental health is a and i think you use this word a multifaceted arena where there's many different variables at play concerning someone's mental health and i think that's and, and if there's something i'm going to get from this podcast and i constantly have to be reminded about it it's that that it's not just one thing it's not just getting enough rest it's not just eating a healthy, uh, eating healthy. It, it's not just enough exercise, sunlight exposure, nature exposure, which is also important. And we, we didn't even talk about that, William, on how, how some countries are now prescribing nature instead of medication. And, 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 and that's okay because we, we, we get to talk about these things in our next podcast. And, and that's so important on, um, because mental health is so it's so broad and it's so big and, and we get to go inside each podcast with the details. Um, but yeah, William, if there's one thing I'm going to take out this podcast is how multifaceted mental health is for an individual. It's not just one thing. There are so many variables at play. Genetics with nurture is just a simple way of putting it. What are you going to take out the podcast today, man? So I, would, I think that the, um, you know, the, the biggest thing is, you know, um, we talked a lot about, um, you know, access uh, to at least somebody that can, you know, get uh, the ball rolling on whether or not there needs to be further steps uh, taken. So, um, you know, of course, we want to make sure that there's caution with, you know, these self-assessments. But, I mean, I think that it's important to... Um, uh, you know, be comfortable with your, uh, you know, physician, uh, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, whoever, uh, whoever you're speaking to, you know, um, be open about saying, you know, I've noticed that, you know, my concentration is off, my energy has changed, my um, irritability is more noticeable. You know, if you're, if you're noticing uh, things of the sort, you know, um, you know, the biggest thing is to know who to ask and don't be afraid to speak up. I think, um, you know, the, the stigma is the diminishing. It is still uh, present, but I think that, uh, um, you know, we need to be careful that because uh, the, the stigma is not going away, that it doesn't keep everyone silent, you know. So um, the biggest thing I'll, I'll take away is that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, keep in mind uh, those people that you should tell that can take the next steps to make sure that you're uh, helped. And, you know, that's a, a, you know, pretty nice theme for a topic like this. And William, thank you for being part of this podcast, man. I really appreciate it. I'm sure the listeners really appreciate what you have to say. And uh, more importantly, I just want to let you know that you are raising mental health awareness um, not only through your practice and what you do at the hospital, and um, but also through just 
collaborating with me on this podcast because you get to reach hundreds of people. And I just want to say thanks, man. Okay. Once again. Well, and Well, thank you, right. man. It's always a, it's always a, you know, like we said, uh, it's interesting about what direction it's going to, if you go. don't mind with the definition trauma, of psychology uh, by the APA, uh, the APA has a very providers, simple, so which is the APA of, is uh, short uh, for uh, the American Psychological Association. So they have a time. very simple way of defining <laughs> I'm psychology, sure the listeners really appreciate it, which man, I because find I get it messages all the to time be very interesting podcast. because it's what Hopefully I was the next taught one we could do 10 years ago, which is psychology is the study of the mind and behavior. But all right, William, we're going to talk soon. About 10 years ago, I remember I had a professor who he changed that definition right there in the class. He put this definition on the board.